I know a number of you will, uh, know Rhonda already, and she's familiar with this industry. Um, I've known her for a number of years because of her work on um, disinfectants and regulation of disinfectants. Uh, Rhonda Jones is, uh, runs a company called SRC, Scientific and Regulatory, and, and she's very involved with uh, EPA and FDA uh, regulations of disinfectants. Um, she has over 20 years of experience in this industry, and she uh, assists her clients on regulatory and microbiological um, uh, issues um, from antimicrobial studies uh, through guidance of audits and uh, GLP compliance, technical marketing, uh, manuscript preparation. And it's wonderful to have her here today, in particular following on from our previous speaker, because I think the the fit is just going to be so very perfect to have Rhonda talking to us about uh, disinfection and the prevention of infectious disease. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you so much. Well, good morning still, and I appreciate very much the invitation to be here with you today. I'm going to take a little bit of a different tactic, but kind of loop right back around to where Dr. Dancer uh, left us uh, in talking about infectious disease and the role of disinfectants and cleaning. So we're going to really quickly run through a little bit of a background. Some of you might be familiar with that, and that's who regulates the disinfectants and how they are regulated, how they're tested, how they get to the market, uh, and what type of scientific evidence carries them through that process. And then, uh, again, a very quick review of a lot of literature that's out there about disinfectants and disease, trying to bring you to the conclusion that uh, there is an incremental benefit to disinfectants um, and that they have been shown to reduce disease, albeit we sure could use more studies in the literature to support that. So when we talk about disinfectants, I want to clear up a little bit of nomenclature first. We're talking about environmental surface disinfectants. Uh, if you're more in the FDA area or the CDC area, you would call these intermediate or low-level disinfectants. We're not talking about high-level disinfectants, the things that are used on critical or semi-critical instruments like endoscopes. Uh, EPA's terminology for these uh, type of products, uh, there are actually three tiers, hospital, general, or limited disinfectants that they register. And the goal of those products is to eliminate many or all pathogenic microorganisms on the inanimate surface with the exception of spores. So who regulates these? EPA regulates these under the Office of Pesticide Programs. They actually now have a specific antimicrobial division that covers these. There's occasionally some other divisions that get involved in some of the more natural ingredients, but that's where most of the work is done. There is a formal legislated registration process that these have to go through to assure their safety and efficacy. Um, as part of that process, the safety uh, is, of the active ingredient is also treated, and oftentimes people coming in with their jug of juice to register have to support all the safety of that active as well if it's not already registered. So there's an extensive amount with the active, in, excuse me, with the active ingredient. Those are chronic environmental and human safety studies that are often multi-million dollars and many, many years of study. So. Those new actives don't come along very often, and, and it's not undertaken very lightly either. So when you have your uh, jug of juice, um, and you know we're going to register that, we do a lot of safety work and a lot of chemistry and a lot of efficacy up front. A lot of companies spend several years in the development process before they even begun to run the pretty good laboratory practice data that has to be sent to the agency to support these types of things. Um, there's three areas, safety, there are six acute toxicology studies that are required. Um, they treat eye, skin, oral, and inhalation type exposures. So on a concentrate, this is done on a concentrated product to make sure that the housekeeping staff, the user, the transportation people, if there is a spill that gives them the appropriate first aid and precautionary statements on the label, and uh, most companies strive to have that be as minimal uh, a safety problem as possible. Chemistry, there's a variety of chemical parameters that are tailored to the type of product, be it a wipe or a liquid or a solid, and it includes both accelerated and long-term shelf stability. 
And then lastly, efficacy studies, and we'll talk about those in some detail. Those are mainly lab studies just to prove the whole concept of killing germs. And then labeling. Um, we spend lots of time working with clients on labeling. EPA has so many rules about what you can and cannot say. And they're not necessarily tailored to uh, the understanding of a housekeeper. Um, EPA lives in sort of a certain world, and they have an opinion about things. Um, for example, they really don't like the word germs anymore, and they're trying to dissuade people from using that. Um, they have a different definition for it than I think the rest of us do. So a lot of work done in labeling. Every word on that label is reviewed by the agency, whether it is pesticidal or antimicrobial claims or whether it's even claims like economic or I'm the first of my kind, they won't let you say those kinds of things. So there are lots of rules there. Be very careful when you look at the market and you say, wow, there's a hole here, there's something missing, there's a gap, we need a product here. Before you run off and spend a lot of time trying to fill that gap, check to make sure there isn't some odd little regulatory box over that gap that says, I'm sorry, we don't let you do that. Because there are gaps, and I'll talk about some of those things that they're preventing you from doing as we go through. Um, all of this work must go into the EPA and be reviewed and accepted before you can sell and market. Okay. Um, once you're approved, you get an EPA registration number, usually a five-digit number, a dash, and it can be up to another five digits there. If a product has been private labeled or supplementally registered from another firm, uh, and they just basically take the label and all its science behind it and smack their own name on it, you'll see another dash and another set of up to five numbers. Uh, there are a lot of supplemental registrations in the market, so you will very commonly see that sort of three sets of numbers. That's that product's unique identification number. There are some exceptions to those kinds of uh, data. Devices, so contraptions, that's the official word, that's not my negative word, but the, the terminology that create the antimicrobial. Um, Mousetrap is, is a great example from more of the rodenticide side of this. Um, for our purposes, antimicrobial would be like an ozonator, um, some of the electrolytic water devices, which I know we have some speakers on that later, um, UV. Those are category, categorized by EPA as devices. Mm -hmm. So in that case, they do not go through the safety and efficacy review of the agency. They are only minimally regulated by EPA, even if those companies beg EPA to do that safety and efficacy review and grant them that number to show the world that, that somebody has done this independent review, they can't get it. They're really disadvantaged in a way of not being able to go through that. There's also a, a very uh, small list of things called 25B pesticides, which are things that are just considered so safe that they don't have to be registered. Again, even if you want to, the agency won't, won't really look at you, although some states come into play here in a minute. Every change on the label, so if there's any sales and marketing people, every little bitty word you want to change on that label has to loop back through the federal agency and be reviewed. There are some short processes, three months is usually in practice how long it takes to get an answer back. There are some that are more like four or five months. But every little bitty change you make, and then when we work with people it always surprises them that they just you know, want to manipulate a sentence around and you know, say kills 99.99% of staph aureus in 30 seconds, which the studies support, but that's not been approved, then that's not something that can be on your label. And by the way, when I say labeling, it's not the immediate package, it's that plus websites, collaterals, point of sale sheets, PowerPoint presentations that you make on behalf of your company. That's all labeling, and you can get enforced against for all of it. Before we leave that, I guess. How long does that process usually take? If it's an existing active ingredient, you can usually get through in about four to five months. Okay. If it's something new, you're looking at more like a year. The other rub in all of this is very rarely does it all get through in a positive manner the first time. There's almost always additional studies, maybe additional questions that come up that have to be answered. There's always labeling discussions at the end, always. And sometimes that drags it out more. But once you have your federal registration, what a lot of people forget and get caught occasionally is that 
You can't really do anything with that in this country. Before you manufacture, distribute, or transfer through or sell in any state, you have to also register in that state. Um, and every state is its own little mini EPA. Some of them, most of them actually, they just want your fee. And they charge an annual fee. Right now we're running about $11,000 per product name per year to pay all the fees in this country. That doesn't include your federal fee that you pay too. So um, it's, it, again, it's an ongoing on, on, to, on cost that you have to consider in this. Again, some states will look at the safety of the active ingredient, not very many, Florida, New York, California. Um, a review of the end product. California basically acts like a mini federal EPA. They review it all. They want all the safety, they want all the tox, they want all the chemistry, they want all the efficacy, and a lot of times they want even more efficacy or they want a field study. So they really are treated almost as an independent agency uh, when you're getting ready to do this or you're in the business of wanting to register one of these. Um, New York and Florida will also sometimes weigh in on safety as well. Uh, chemistry, efficacy, California, all of it. Labeling, every single one of those states looks at the label. Most of them are not very vocal. But it is not uncommon to get to the point where you have a federal registration and you're working on these states and you've got four or five states that want changes in your label. Maybe they're opposing changes. And maybe they're things you already talked to about EPA and they won't approve. And unfortunately, what we're seeing as time goes on is the states are getting more and more vocal. They are pushing more and more of agenda. So to get a national registration across all these states is becoming more and more challenging. It often takes a loop back through federal and a loop back through California to get it all done, to get one label that everybody agrees to. It's very difficult. Um, and again, before you manufacture in a state, distribute through a state, drive a truck with it in through a state, sell or market in a state, you have to have that. So even if you go to a show like this and go to the exhibit hall with your brand new thing you just got through, if you have federal registration and you don't have registration in the state of Maryland, you are putting yourself at risk for enforcement. Most of the states, this process goes very, very quickly, a um, couple of months, and you can have probably 45 states. California takes as long or longer as federal. Right now, anything with efficacy data is taking at least 10 months in California all by itself. New York is running four to six months and getting longer every day. Uh, Florida, not so long, although they will ask some safety questions. So the whole regulatory process, you know, you spend years in development, then we spend anywhere from six months to a year doing the pretty data to send into the agency under full good laboratory practices, and then you could end up in this regulatory loop for two years. Sometimes it gets through faster, sometimes 12 months, but usually if you're looking at national distribution, you want all the states, you probably want some territories, you're going to spend a couple of years waiting. So um, back to our exceptions with devices. There are some states that don't agree with federal and they are registering those devices. Only a handful though. Um, and, and some states only certain kinds like the water type devices, the water cleansing devices. 25B pesticides, some states will register those and some states won't. So it's, it's quite a mess. And again, every change has to be pre-approved by federal and the states. So every time you want to reposition something or change how it's marketing or emphasize something, or maybe you have new data and you now can add MRSA and VRE claims, um, you got to go back through the beginning. And the times are basically the same. And there's a cost to all of that. EPA now has review fees for service, so you have to pay that too. FDA, how are they involved in this? Um, if they're involved, it's the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, CDRH. They are the ones who hold the jurisdiction over high-level disinfectants, which we're not really talking about today, and they grant 510Ks. They also still have some hold over intermediate and low-level disinfectants. There's actually been some formal documents dividing the world up between EPA and FDA. You know, they get EPA ended up with intermediate low-level, and FDA ended up with high-level. But they really still are sort of connected in that if you have a hospital disinfectant or a general disinfectant and you've put hospital items on it or non-critical equipment on it, so it could be bed rails, could be a wheelchair, 
you are potentially still under FDA's purview and you would have to, uh, they don't have like a safety and efficacy review process like I just described for EPA for these, but you are required to manufacture to a higher standard. You have to man manufacture under device GMPs, it's called QSR, or quality system regulation, whereas right now EPA doesn't have that kind of manufacturing standard. You're also subject to any medical device reporting if you have complaints of certain types, and you're subject to FDA audits. And oh, by the way, the EPA things, EPA comes in and audits your facility, they audit your records, they pull your samples, they test them. A lot of the states have testing programs too for efficacy, uh, as well as chemistry. So, so if you're a you know, intermediate or low level disinfectant, which would be equal to a hospital disinfectant on the EPA side, you are still under some FDA involvement and they can come and audit you. They don't do it very frequently. They seem to be out doing it a lot right now, which you probably don't want to hear. Um, CDC, how are they involved? Well, they really don't regulate the disinfectants. They don't grant registrations. They don't grant certifications. What they really regulate is the users. They, and they don't really regulate them, they establish guidelines. Um, and we are anxiously awaiting HICPAC, their committee that does this kind of work, their 2002 draft guidelines for disinfection and sterilization in healthcare facilities. We're anxiously awaiting, and I've heard we're getting very close to its publication anytime soon. Um, and so they don't <clears throat> really affect whether a disinfectant's on the market or not, but they affect how you use it, how often it's used. I know someone in the back asked some questions about how often to clean, and this particular document, which is available on the HICPAC site, will give you all of the instructions that they're going to come out with, with right now with the best evidence we had, and as Dr. Dancer said, we really need evidence on frequency and what types of things to clean. But even in the CDC guideline, they are looking at these high-touch surfaces as being different than environmental surfaces like walls and floors. And they're recommending disinfection for both and a, a pretty high frequency of doing that kind of thing. So I would suggest if you're looking for those user guidelines to go read that document, it's an excellent overview. The thing to point out here as we sort of start to talk about uh, more of the interruption of disease is that to become registered and to get out there and sell in states and the federal government, it's only lab efficacy testing. And we throw the words efficacy and effectiveness around an awful lot, but most people will look at efficacy and assign it as a lab type study, not always. I think these words get misused a lot. With EPA and state, you only need that lab type of thing. And even if you do run a fabulous clinical study like some of the ones that were talked about, some of the ones we'll see, and you bring it to EPA, they'll look at it, but they'll say, no, we do not allow claims for interruption of disease. They're even taking away the cross-contamination claims that they had allowed for years. And that's their new stance, is that they just do the lab testing type claims. So even if you had it and you brought it forward to the agency and it was an awesome study and everyone loved it, you probably still would not be able to actually make a claim on the product. And you really can't technically sell by pointing to your journal article either, which might disappoint some of you as well. FDA, on the other hand, they have all those lab studies, but they have this effectiveness piece where they require actually simulated use and in-use data of these disinfectants on endoscopes before they're granted a place in the market. So a little bit different between the two agencies as to how they register. So how are disinfectants tested? What are the efficacy testing like? Many of you will probably have heard us moan in this industry about the AOAC tests. They're standardized in quotes, lab tests that we have to follow. That's our benchmark for getting into the market with a disinfectant or a sanitizer. And there's lots of those methods and they are paired to the types of use patterns and the types of claims that you want to make. So sometimes you need to run one test and sometimes you need to run another depending on what you're doing. When these tests are done, multiple lots are tested and at least one of those lots has to be aged at least 60 days in the testing. Um, for the sort of standard minimum set of claims to do this with, each of the lots are tested 60 times per organism. And then if you add any extras, like an extra would be MRSA or staph or uh, VRE or PR, PRSP, some of those other ones, 
you would test 10 times on the organism per lot. So fairly extensive testing. Here's again the three tiers that EPA recognizes. For a hospital grade product, if you're a liquid or a concentrate, you're gonna run the AOAC used dilution method. It literally has been around for 50 years. It's not as reproducible a standard as you would like to have, but it is what we all regulate by uh, right now. There are efforts afoot at the OECD global level to change that. That'll be coming in the next few years. To get to the hospital level, you have to show effectiveness against certain specific strain of Staph aureus, Salmonella enteritia, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. If you do that, you're allowed to use the word disinfectant on your label, and you're allowed to have hospital settings, healthcare settings, healthcare devices, that kind of thing. If you either choose not to test Pseudomonas, or your product is not effective against Pseudomonas, so you're only staph and salmonella, you are called a general disinfectant, and you are not allowed to label with hospital devices, hospital healthcare areas. So there's a little cutoff there. Then the last level, the limiteds, they are effective against either the gram-positive side of the bacterial world or the gram-negative side. So you either are passing staph aureus or you're passing salmonella. What you don't know is whether a company chose not to spend the money to test or whether the product was truly necessarily ineffective. Most people just automatically jump to the fact that if you don't have the claim on the label, then you must not be effective. But that, that is actually not always the case uh, because of the testing cost burden um, and the time to add. Um, when we do these, so if you think about this, if you're testing at least three lots on each of these three required organisms and you're testing each one of these 60 times, you have 540 tests that are done individually. Again, laboratory tests on high levels of these dried organisms. We usually see that the tests are coming out about six logs. For some of you who struggle with this, that's a million bacteria, six zeros. Or if you like to talk in the 99s, it's 99.999% reduction, so six nines. So those are all equal, same thing. So high levels of dried organisms are tested on representative hard surfaces, stainless steel penny cylinders, glass slides, that type of thing. And so this is done 540 times. And that's the very minimal basic set. That will get you the phrase bactericidal and the phrase hospital disinfectant if you do all three of these. Soil. Most people don't understand um, the bit about soil. It's really kind of an archaic regulatory setup kind of thing. Somewhere, maybe 50 or more years ago, the agency decided that soil would be represented in these tests by animal serum. I suppose somebody somewhere along the way maybe did some looking at protein levels. I, I honestly don't know if that's ever been done. I've never been able to trace where that came from. Uh, Europe likes to use yeast in their studies when they do it. Um, and there's a new one coming that's kind of a combination of albumins and mucin and some other things that we'll probably switch to. And someone long ago decided 5% was the magic level of animal serum to add to the bacteria before drying in order to be able to give you a soil claim. So when you do this, you take your culture of bacteria, you mix 5% soil in, well, it's 5% of the culture, and then you dry that all down on the carriers for 40 minutes at high temperatures. That is what the disinfectant is exposed to, and you must kill all but one out of 60 of those 60 tests in order to pass that test. If you run all of your tests with soil, so every organism on the label, you can avoid having a use instruction that says pre-clean all surfaces. This is very subtle, and I don't think a lot of people really understand that. The 5% soil doesn't add a lot of cost to the tests, but it can be, especially for the oxidative type disinfectants, a huge challenge. But this is the difference between a one-step product, which you guys probably have heard, and a two-step product. If you've included soil in your studies, you, don't, you only have to say pre-clean heavy soil, and sometimes EPA forgets to put, have you put that in your use directions, but those are the rules is that you only have to pre-clean, they like to say gross filth, but we've finally gotten them to say heavy soil, it's a little kinder. Um, but that's your difference between one-step and two-step products. 
And then you can test a whole plethora of other things. You can be tuberculocidal, virucidal. With, with tuberculocidal, it's interesting. Here's a change you can be on the lookout for. We have always, always, always gotten that claim by testing the cow mycobacteria, Mycobacterium bovis. A long time ago, the really long name of it was Mycobacterium bovis variant tuberculosis BCG. It's actually the, wow, 10 minutes left. Whew, if I can talk longer than I, I realized I could. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> but anyway, the agency has allowed us to say M tuberculosis because that was in the original name. You're going to see over the next couple of years that's going to change. That's going to go away and you're going to start to see M bovis. You'll still be able to say tuberculocidal, but you won't be able to say M tuberculosis on your labels anymore. And there's little fun things like that going on all the time in this industry. But there's a whole list of a bunch of other things that your product can test for and become. Um, claims are always changing. Here's a list of the hot viruses that are being added, the hot bacteria. Of course, the community acquired MRSAs, everybody's out testing those. Um, one of the biggies that's just started happening is the EPA has, in the early 90s, decided to allow C. diff vegetative claims against the vegetative. The, if you remember Dr. Dancer's slide of the great big rod shaped organism she had up here with a little spore in the end. Um, it's very difficult to test these because they don't like air. Just like she was saying, it's very difficult to pull them from the surface. It's even more difficult to make a disinfectant lab test for them. So we were first able to do that with the vegetative strains. So in 92, 93, EPA decided that was a good claim. It was a good test. They let everybody have that claim who wanted to go out and run the tests. Now they have just decided no. It's misleading because the real cul culprit of our public health crisis with that organism is the spore. We don't yet have a test for the spore that the agency will approve. Um, now you may say, well, you can be a sporicide. Yes, but the agency has not decided that that method is okay for C. diff for some reason. So we're battling a quasi-science, quasi-regulatory thing. But in the meantime, what you're going to see is these claims are coming off everyone's label. It may take about 18 months from right now. The letters went out last month, but that's coming off. This will eventually go back on. The industry will find a way. And there are ways to test for that right now. I just, we're, we have a little regulatory problem we need to work out first. Another quick thing to tell you is the Air Resources Board in California very aggressively pushing VOC controls on products. And the green people who want green disinfectants. First of all, you need to know EPA will not let you say green, environmentally preferable, any of that kind of stuff. Now that's not to say, because I saw two last week that snuck through, but the rule is no green claims on disinfectants, all right? So the problem is, though, is everybody still wants green. The legislators are making it mandatory that states buy and schools buy green. How are they going to figure out what, what a green disinfectant is? So that's coming. Something's going to happen there. There's either going to be some new certification, some new system, but that need to have green disinfectants is going on, and this need to have lower VOC levels, it's pushing all these products to be reformulated. And as they get reformulated, the stuff that has the nasties in it are the things that make it work. So somewhere, we all have to have this balance of having the killing power and not having problems in the environment or with toxicology. So, all right, little quick cartoon here. Uh, I think because of time, I'll rush through that, but you've got it there. So disinfectants and disease, really, really quickly. Dr. Dancer covered many of the things I have already. What do we really need for di disease? We need the pathogens. They have to be able to survive in the environmental surfaces. Um, they ha the surfaces have to become contaminated. The pathogens have to remain infectious on those surfaces, and those have to be transmitted somehow to patients to hands of caregivers, to patients, to surfaces, to hands of caregivers, to patients. I think you get the idea. And then, of course, I don't have anything on, the, on here about the host, but the host has to be susceptible, and there's a million different factors in that as well. I always put this on here because we're about to talk about some kind of gross, disgusting studies that have been done. It can be offensive to some people. I think Dr. Dancer talked about a number of things. I always consider myself a success as a speaker as if at least one person goes running from the room with tissues on their hands as they, uh, as they leave and we talk about these organisms being everywhere. But um, I'm also very conscious every time I touch my nose because of the whole one in three with staff up your nose is interesting. 
We are going to talk about some diseases. I'm sure some of you have had some personal experiences with these, so I, it is not my intention to upset anyone with that, but we're going to talk about some of these things, and, and you may find some of it upsetting. So do pathogens survive on surfaces? This is just an extremely quick review of the literature, and it's certainly not all the literature, but it's out there. These things survive. They, get in the, they may not necessarily be replicating, That'll depend a lot on what they're puddled in and how long they're puddled in it. But if you know somebody doesn't get to some fecal material or some mucus or something like that, it is possible they'll continue to divide on those surfaces. Um, not for long. Usually they exhaust their uh, supply of nutrition, but it's possible. So I've tried to put in some hospital as well as uh, home. So here's staff, 24 hours on home kitchen surfaces. Uh, 10 days on dry surfaces for staff. MRSA, uh, Dr. Dancer went through that 14 days on Formica. Six to nine weeks on a cotton blanket. Um, VRE greater than seven days on fabric chairs, up to 16 weeks on plastic. C. diff, five months on floors. 40 days on a hospital room after the surfaces were terminally cleaned after the patient had left. Um, some really cool studies being done. I always get passionate about the science. I apologize if you've been affected by this personally, but really cool studies, but scary being done, and we'll talk about some of those about that. How many days after the patient with the bug left the room did it continue to stay there to be transmitted? It's a very different way than we have been thinking about that. Uh, viruses, got 10 days here for rotavirus, 24 hours for rhinovirus, RSV, influenza A and B, six hours on paper. If you sneeze into a magazine, Six hours later, on that page, you've left your mark still. So next time you're sitting in a doctor's office, you might want to think about that. So yes, pathogens survive on the surfaces. Um, great little cartoon. Uh, the female figure here is cleaning up what appears to be the breakfast dishes. And the male figure says, did you read this in the paper? Kitchen dish rags breed more germs than toilets. Billions of micro organisms thrive in, and she's got her rag that she just cleaned breakfast up with, and you know, she's kind of going like that, and she said, oh, this is really in the category of things I didn't want to know, kind of like the nose thing from earlier, and uh, the male figure says, now you know how I feel about cholesterol, so a little something. So do surfaces become contaminated? Well, yes, I think uh, Dr. Dancer went through a lot of that. Um, there's some interesting work where Scientists have looked at what types of infection cause more or less types of contamination of the area. You know, think of the old um, Charlie Brown cartoon pig pen where he had that cloud of dirt around him. I mean, that's, we all have that cloud. It's full of skin cells, it's full of staph, and everywhere we go, we're putting it down. And if it is MRSA that's in that cloud, or VRE, or C. diff, uh, we have a potential problem with transmission. So if you have a wound or urine infection, the surfaces around you, about 36% of the time, you'll see that. If you have essentially a gastrointestinal tract infection with either MRSA or VRE and you have diarrhea with it, 59% of the surfaces in your surrounding area, 49% for here. No diarrhea, a little bit less. If you have multiple body sites, you know, this is all pretty logical, I think, but until recently, a lot of this work had not been done yet. Typical standard outpatient clinic, I have three kids, I'm in there more often than I want to be. 19% of the surfaces in the waiting room have MRSA on. C. diff, we actually looked at that already with Dr. Dancer. If you happen to have a chicken that has E. coli and you're at home working with it on your cutting board or whatever, 60 to 100% of the surfaces in and around you will get contaminated with that. If you have an egg, anybody have the eggs this morning? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but you crack an egg into a bowl, you know, we're whipping it up, we're gonna make ourselves a little omelet before we go to work in the morning, a little scrambled eggs or something. Uh, this particular study showed that up to 16 inches, basically from that whipping action, even though you saw no splashing out of the bowl or nothing out of the ordinary, you're just whipping it up with your little fork, 16 inches were contaminated around you. So if you're doing that right next to your cutting board or your glass of juice in the morning or, you know, so 
it's kind of interesting as we start to develop more and more of this kind of data on what is where and how is it moving, it's becoming very interesting to look at solutions. Um, okay, let's move through. So more studies, um, some really interesting studies. Boyce has done a lot of this work where they, again, look at how you can move, how the organisms transfer in these environments. They had healthcare workers who were not caring for the patients put on clean gloves and go touch objects in a patient's room and then they cultured the gloves to see if it could move from a bed rail or a bedside stand or um, the dining table that's over the bed. 42% of the time with MRSA and 46% for VRE. Um, Another similar study, 31% of staff, of which 35% of those are MRSA, 46% of VRE. Um, here's another one, patient with staph or MRSA uh, moves out of the room. We do our terminal cleaning that we always do. They send in these volunteers with gloves on and they have them touch bed rails and tables. 20% of the time after cleaning, that hand has come away with the VRE of the patient. 7% of the time the staff. Uh, let's see, let's try, I have like two minutes, so we're gonna go this really fast. Do pathogens transfer from surface? These are more studies that show that that transfer can happen and how, fit, how fast it can happen. Uh, up here we have when you sneeze into your tissue and you miss that waste basket, somebody's gotta pick it up for you. For 15 minutes that tissue can transfer influenza. Uh, if you've sneezed onto stainless steel surface eight hours, you can still move it. Here's a very interesting study in a daycare. They took a cauliflower vi virus, which wasn't pathogenic, and they put it on a toy in a daycare facility. 28 days later, they could find it everywhere. And in nine homes, they found it. These kids took it home with them. So these things do move. I don't know why we have to keep proving to people that they're there, and they do move, and you can move them around. But they're there, and I guess I should be fair, a lot of this data is probably mostly in the last 10 years, although there were, as uh, I think Liz said and Dr. Dancer said, there were people who had the light bulb go on for them uh, much earlier, but now it seems like everybody's racing to do these kinds of studies. Um, there's more interesting ones in there, but for time. Uh, this is one of my favorites. We're all staying in hotels, I think, probably most of us. You might wanna cover your ears. So they did a study, they had 15 volunteers that had rhinovirus colds, they had them stay in a hotel room for 24 hours, they asked them to use the phone, watch TV, flip the light switches, doorknobs, faucets, basically do whatever they normally would do in a hotel room. And what they basically found after the occupants moved out is that 87% of the subjects transferred cold viruses to the surface, 66% um, contaminated multiple sites, uh, highest contamination was on the door handles, then the light switches, telephones, and TV remote controls in that order. They actually had, they collected each person's individual virus. So they had Rhonda's rhinovirus in a vial. They had us, not me, I wasn't in it, but they had the people come back then after they were well to see if they could essentially give them back their rhinovirus, and they could. Uh, they put the rhinovirus on a hard surface, and up to an hour, they could still transfer 60% to the fingertips of that person. And up to 18 hours later, they could still transfer 30% to the person. So another interesting, but very creative study designs coming along to look at this. Do disinfectants kill pathogens on surfaces? Yes, that's really part of what EPA does when they register it. They look at those kinds of studies, and we've talked about that. Um, do disinfectants reduce transmission from surfaces? Here's a number of studies that get to that. There's not as many studies on this as I would love to have, and I think some of these more creative things, as we start to do like that rhinovirus study, and then we look at different interruptions with disinfectants or with cleaning, that we'll begin to see you know, what kinds of things we really need to be doing and, and what training we need to do of our, of our housekeeping staff. Um, so you can kind of look at that. There's a disinfectant spray that was shown to be 100% effective in preventing the transmission of rotavirus to human volunteers. At the same time that there was no cases of rotavirus in the disinfectant group, 93% of the people in the control group uh, became effective. Again, more studies. Each one of these represents a different study. 
uh, showing disinfection of cutting boards or some from homes down here to reduce the different transmission. Some of these were done by people in the room. Um, do disinfectants reduce disease? Uh, Dr. Dancer actually talked about the cruise ship already for us. Um, here's another older one where uh, there was an outbreak of typhoid in a psychiatric institution. And what they found is that they really had to bump up the environmental hygiene with the disinfectant in order to uh, cease that outbreak. Um, a couple more here on burn units with BRE. Yeah. Okay, and here's another one, really uh, kind of one of the better studies in daycare uh, that uh, Gene did that he'll t maybe mention in his talk. Sorry, I don't have time to go through these, but good list, a little uh, blurb about every single one of them showing the different interruptions with disinfectants of disease. Some of these were done alongside just basic cleaning. So you have a comparison to cleaning to show that the disinfectants added an incremental benefit. Um, let me go through those. Kind of to begin to close, additional study is always needed on this. There needs to be more of these studies where we look at this transfer rate and, and this daily rate of continuing to have things there and look at where, what are the really important high touch surfaces to focus on, to focus on cleaning, how to clean them, whether to clean them or disinfect them, uh, how to improve the consistency and the uniformity of that terminal cleaning and disinfection. In some ways, I think disinfectants are where antiseptics were maybe five to 10 years ago where we began this whole effort to try and figure out how to improve compliance. In a way, we're kind of coming to that, I think, with disinfection and improving compliance of the cleaning there. Um, just additional work all around to understand this. It's a little cartoon. This is supposed to be the clean room, so we'll give it an additional five minutes. So, so in summary, pathogens persist on surfaces. Surfaces can transmit pathogens to hands of caregivers or other surfaces. Transmission of pathogens from surfaces can result in disease. Disinfection reduces pathogens on surfaces. Disinfection can interrupt the transmission cycle. And proper and judicious use of disinfectants can be an important part of any infection control program. Questions at their time?